All right, get your pencil out. And I have a couple of questions we're going to start with today. What issues are dividing Americans today? That's what we're going to be looking at. The biblical basis for division. And if you can write social issues, that'll be fine, but you can write more issues than that. You can talk about it together at your table, and then we're going to look at them together. What's dividing this country today? What social issues are we struggling with? I saw Josiah's hand up. What are you going to say, Josiah? Politics. Politics. Yeah, there seem to be Democrats and Republicans, right? Okay, Katie and Kendon. Abortion. Abortion. That's a social issue. So if you didn't write abortion down, you should have that one down. What is another social issue that we are wrestling with today? Gender. Gender, that's right. Gender, transgenderism, it's a big thing. What is a man, what is a woman? All of that is a big issue today. Josiah. And a furry. <laughs> uh, Mr. B doesn't hear everything the way he should. And a furry. You know, a furry? Furry? So people who... Who they identified as an animal. Oh, I've never heard of that word in oh, yeah. my life. You are teaching me. How do you spell it, John? F-U-R-R-Y. Furry. Like a dog is furry. And so people who identify with an animal, I am a dog. How many of you knew that word? Now you embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> so furry is a social issue. Thank you, Joe Science. I'm impressed. What other social issue? Yes. Marriage. Yeah, what is marriage? Is it between a man and a woman? Is it between two men, two women? Issues that we never dreamed we would have to define. Anything else? Joe? Environmentalism. All right. Environmentalism. Okay, I'm not going to take a lot of time on that. These are the ones that I came up with, size of government. That's not necessarily a social issue, but it really begins to affect us. You believe in big government, or do you believe in small government? What is the biblical view of government? Is it big government, or is the biblical view of government small government? If you look in the, the Bible, what is the responsibility of government? What, what authority does God give it? Abby. To provide security and ordain order. Thank you. You're looking at Romans chapter 13. It is to protect the good and it is to punish evil. That's all it's supposed to do. It's not to provide uh, support to the poor. It's not to be involved in education. It's only to protect what is good and to punish what is evil. Climate change. Is that what you were talking about too, Joe? I, I was thinking so. Climate change. Is that, you know, is that really an issue today? Well, it is a big issue in our life today. And fossil fuels. And I just heard on the news that New Zealand farmers now are going to have to pay a tax on their cow's fat, uh, flatulence. May I say it that way? 
because they believe, the government believes, that that is one of the causes of climate change. Amazing. So these become great social issues. Open borders is a big issue. I think that's a social issue. What do we do in the world with these people coming, looking for a better life? That's a big issue. And this is the one that Kendon already gave us, the definition of marriage. We never dreamed we'd have to define what marriage is. But today, we must. And here is the one on transgenderism, genderism, human sexuality. It's a big issue today, a big social issue in our culture. And then we have the issue of abortion, which also takes a tremendous amount of our news and the reactions to that. Uh, parental involvement in education. Do children, do parents have any involvement in education? Or when we put our children in school, do the parents relinquish their authority, their responsibility to their children? And finally, what I put in here is law enforcement and justice the defund the police movement and the way that so many criminals are being released without any type of punishment uh, is a big problem. And I think these become social issues, finally, in our life. Anybody want to add to any of that? Then I go to this question. Why are these dividing us? Why do they divide us? What is the root? Joe? Humanism. Humanism. Humanism is, how do you define humanism? Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. How many of you would agree that humanism plays a role in the division in this country? Pam, I saw your hand coming up. I was going to say different worldviews. Different worldviews. When we talk about worldviews, what are we talking about? World your, view. your view of God, your view of who you are, why you're here. Your view of God, view of yourself, why while you were uh, why you were here. How many of you have a world view? You better all get your hand up <laughs> because everybody has a world view. We talked about that earlier. Where did you come from? What are you here for? What's wrong with men? How do we fix the problem? What happens to us after we die? Those are worldviews. But it's not only man, it's a worldview of creation. It's a worldview of God's authority. It's a worldview of God's promises. It's a worldview of the covenant. All of those things are in a worldview, and Pam, you hit the nail on the head right here. Differing worldviews is where we come from. And so you and I can speak together, I think, rather comfortably here, because I think all of us here have a similar worldview. We're going to find places where we do not agree fully, but we have these differing worldviews. Then, number three, what is the biblical basis for this division? This is, of course, I'm thinking biblically. Where does this division 
Where does it begin? Where does it start biblically? The fall. And then you have some things which God is, is, is doing. I want to show you this, Genesis 3.15. And today I'm going to start up in the front row here. And Isabella, would you like to read this verse for us? Can you read it? And I will put enmity between you and your woman, and, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and he will stretch his heel. Is that anything to do with the division that we face today? How do you see that as a biblical understanding? The seed of the woman would be Christ, Christ and his church. his church. The seed of the serpent would be the world. the world. Who puts this enmity? God does. Now, take a look at that. What is God's purpose in establishing this enmity? I will put this enmity between you and the woman. God speaking to Satan. What's the purpose of this enmity? It comes from God. Well, you remember what had happened just prior to, you know, to God speaking this way. Eve and Adam it's the order it happened, I will also say Adam and Eve, had made a covenant with Satan. Remember his offer. He said, you know, are, are you allowed to eat of every tree in the garden? And Eve says, well, you know, we can eat of every tree, but we may not eat of that one. We may even touch it. And then Satan says, uh, and she says, if we do, we will die. And Satan says, well, you're not going to die. Trust me. And if I can give you a much better future, if you follow me, you're going to know good and you're going to know evil. Try it. And then Eve takes and she eats. Now understand, eating with someone and you can even talk about that here this evening. We eating together means we are in covenant together. We're one in purpose. We are together. We agree with each other. There's nothing dividing us. We, we, we join together. That's the really meaning of eating. And so when Eve eats, in the presence of Satan, she is joining herself and Adam eats, and they become united in a covenant. God breaks that covenant. They can't. They are in the grip of Satan. We would say they were dead in sin. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. And so, God comes in and he says to his people, to Adam and Eve, he says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the serpent. I'm going to tear you apart and you are never, ever going to be in covenant with Satan. Because I put enmity between you. What's another word for enmity? Division. 
division, hatred. division, struggle, hatred. That's what it is. And so that plays out in our life with these issues. We hate them. We're opposed to them. Because you and I are filled with the Spirit. We're filled with the Word of God. The Holy Spirit leads us into the truth. And when we know the truth, then what is false is something that we are in enmity with. We cannot agree with them. We cannot shake their hand. doesn't mean we hate them, but it means that we are not in fellowship with them. Uh, it's like, uh, how many of you ski? Very few of you. Oh, you do ski. All right. But if you have skis and one ski is going this way and one is going to go this way, there comes a point where we cannot, you know, continue to be together. You have to get rid of one ski or you're going to have some problems. And so there comes a point in our culture, in our world, that we separate from those things which we are in enmity with. So God's purpose is to protect you, to protect the church. And so is this enmity a blessing or is it a curse? It's a blessing. Understand that. And that blessing is the blessing that God gave Abram. I will bless you and you will be a blessing. God's blessing is knowing God. God's blessing is revealing himself to us. It's him living in us. It's him choosing us before the creation of the world to be made holy, to be made righteous in his sight. And David talks about it this way. He says, you lead me in paths of righteousness. That's Psalm 23. Because the enmity that God places between the seed of the woman, the children of the woman, the offspring of the woman, and the serpent is a protector. David writes Psalm 139, and he says, you go before me, you go behind me, you go beside me. That all has to do with Genesis 3.15. When you read the rest of the scripture, you can understand it all from Genesis 3.15. Because it is all playing out the enmity that God places between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And this is an eternal enmity. It's not something that sort of disappears in history. It remains in the people of God. And it is God's blessing. It's not a curse. All right. Any comment you want to make? Any question you want to give? Do you agree? Make sense to you? And so I guess I answered this question, how do we experience this enmity? Because as we see the culture moving away from what we once thought, believed, had a biblical foundation. All the laws that were passed in the, in the United States, and I, I want to probably say most of the laws, they always uh, were, were based in the Ten Commandments. They were based in the moral law. All the laws that we have about work and hours of working and work conditions in the factories and 
the unions came involved to really protect the workers, at that time, all of those had a biblical base. You shall not kill is all related to how we treat the people that are working for us. And so we're always, we're passing laws that really reflected, really flushed out the moral law until the last 50 years. And now we're passing laws which go against the moral law. And abortion is one of those. Uh, you know, the, the sexuality is another one. And that's why we're having this division. Because you and I have a biblical worldview. And we cannot compromise it. Because God has placed that enmity in your and my life. And so these things, we need to oppose them. We need to react against them. In the way we interpret the world, how do, how, does, uh, how do we see this? Well, in the way we interpret the world is one way that we see this enmity played out. I really like what you said, Pam. I think that's really foundational to how we understand all of these things. If, as Joe said, you're talking about a humanist, Basically, the, the difference between a humanist and a Christian, uh, you know, they both do a lot of good work. They're all, they're all kind, they're all loving, and those kinds of things. But a humanist does not believe God is on the throne. The humanist believes man is on the throne. And man determines what is right. And man determines what is wrong. And as you said, everybody does what is right in their own eyes is really the fruit of humanism. You and I follow God, we follow Christ, and our goal is to honor and glorify Him. We do not believe we are free to do anything else. And so when we ask the question, who am I? How do you define who you are? Where do you go? Scripture. The scripture. Thank you. And so, the humanist, where does he go? Where does she go? Themselves. Themselves. A couple weeks ago, we talked about, you know, do you belong to your parents? Do you belong to the state? Do you belong to yourself? Do you belong to God? All of those have tremendous implications for how you and I see the world. So who am I? You're going to go to the scripture. And so this next question, what factors do we use to determine who we are? Because, you know, I don't want to get deep into this, but this is the, the thing, you know, you ask somebody what a man is or what a woman is, it's a shocking. I don't, I don't really know. I'm not a scientist. So, what factors do you use to determine if you're a man or a woman? You just look at your body, right? And that's determinative. And you can look at it scientifically, and if you have only X chromosomes, you're a woman. If you have X and Y chromosomes, you're a male. You can go that direction also. But it's still the body that we're looking at. And so, is my identity self-created or God-given? And everybody said, God -given. correct. <clears throat> but now that's rejected. Why is that being rejected? They have to keep God out of the picture. This is humanism. 
when you follow humanism, you don't have any brakes and B-R-A-K-E-S, like you have on your car. There's no brakes to stop culture, to stop ideas. And so that's where we're going. And, and so these things, they keep progressing. So if I belong to myself, which is really, uh, you know, what I think is controlling our culture today, then I identify with whoever I want to be. And so that's the big problem. That requires a whole different view. They're not looking at the body and saying, well, my body is telling me I am a male, I am a female. And, you know, don't raise your hand, but I bet most of you guys, you put on women's clothes once upon a time, right? When you were a kid, keep your hands down. <laughs> <laughs> and you women, there's a day, where, you know, there's these things, all right? But it's not you. You go through that. Well, today, if a child would be, you know, a boy's hot with that, with, you know, playing around with dolls and everything, well, my goodness, you're probably a girl trapped in a man's body that's really going on. You, 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 you hear about that. You read that. And so this is where we are today because humanism is at enmity with the word of God. Is gender, psychological, psycho means it's in my mind, or is it physiological? Is it my physics, my body, or is it both? You got to answer. All right, go vote on it. Who believes that my gender, your gender, is psychological? It's all up in my head. Not a soul. I knew that. How many of you believe it is physiological? It has to do with your physics. And who says it's both? I think you can go there because, Anne, what are you going to You put your hand up for what reason? Well, I, I just think you have to wear them. But you don't believe that. I don't know exactly how to explain it to you. I think we differences, so. What you're saying is, men and women think differently. We all know that. But when you are male, you think you're male. You know you're male. When you're female, you believe you're female. You know you're male. You're female. And so your physiological and your physical are in harmony. There are some individuals, I think it's because of sin in the world, that do not have that harmony. And I'm not going to be harsh on them at all. But you and I have this harmony that both physically and psychologically we know our gender. If it's determined psychologically, which is now becoming the norm, what cultural artifacts need to be dismantled? When I'm talking about artifacts here, I'm not talking about something we dig up and here's a piece of pottery. I'm talking about the controlling principles that have shaped our culture. To this point, they are being dismantled. What cultural artifacts need to be dismantled if we have to begin to think now gender is psychological? Marriage. Marriage. Correct. 
uh, requires a redefinition of marriage that fits in, that describes the present desire, the present reality. And we have to dismantle what we have always believed to be the determining factor of maleness and female. That is being dismantled. When this happened in the past, then we always believed that this person has a psychological problem. You are male, you are female. And you've got to, you know, have psychological help so that you will be in sync with your physiology. That's being dismantled. And they're saying, now, we need to dismantle the idea that your gender is determined by your physiology. We need to perform surgery on you. We need to give you puberty blockers. We need to give you uh, male and female hormones. The body now is wrong and your mind is correct. Do you see that big shift? That's what is happening. And what is happening then is that there are people, and some of these are, are children, they're young starting at the age of eight years old, they are being given surgeries and giving drugs that are irreversible. So this is, this is a big problem. I just want, I can't solve it, I just want you to know. How do we minister to someone struggling with gender dysphoria? This gender dysphoria means in my mind, I think I'm a girl, but my body tells me I'm a man, I'm a boy. How do we minister to such people? Giving them the scripture. Giving them the scripture. You teach them. It is, uh, you know, it's, it takes time to work with them, but it, it's a way that I'm not qualified to do that, but we're going to work with them psychologically. So their mind is accepting of their physical nature, which God has determined. If it's physiological, how do we minister to someone struggling with gender dysphoria? It's going to be the very same way. We're going to work with them to see that God has given them this gender and God gave them that gender because he's designed them for the work that he's created for them to do. That's a real simple, quick answer. But I want you to understand when you are hearing these things on the news and reading about them, do you see what's going on? There is this great tension between the two. Now, Psalm 2 is another very interesting psalm, and I believe, Lily, we are already up to you for reading verses. <laughs> Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his atonement, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Thank you. Take a look at that. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? That's my question on the next slide, but I'm not going to change it. I'm just going to let it stay right here. How do you answer the question? Why do the nations rage? Why do the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord? Why are they saying... Let's burst their bonds. Let's not be controlled by God. Let's cast away the moral law. That's what we see today. How do you explain? Because they 
Because of sin. Because of sin. Isabel, you are extremely correct. I believe what you're seeing is Romans 1. Romans 1, where God gives some people over to disobedience. That's what he's doing. He's not stopping. He's not interfering. He's not giving them a guilty conscience. He's not giving them a sense of shame. Not giving them a sense of embarrassment. But the people whom God is giving over to disobedience, he darkens their minds. He causes them to do things that are not natural. Just read Romans chapter 1. I should have put it on here, but I did not. And I think that is what you and I are seeing. That's another biblical basis for the division that we see in our culture. And then God says, the one enthroned in heaven laughs, the Lord scoffs at them. Why is God laughing? Josiah. Because people think they can roll over him. I love your answer, Josiah. You stole the words out of my mouth. It's not a laughter of humor. It's a laughter of derision. It's like, this is the way picture in my mind I see, is that this little kid is running away from mom as fast as he can go, and mom is on his tail and picks him up and his feet are still running, and mom says, I gotcha. <laughs> A laughter of derision. You are right, Josiah. People believe they can throw off God's chains. Those chains are the laws of God. The covenant that God has made with us. And he says, I will bless you when you worship me and you obey me. And when you turn away from me, I'm going to frustrate you and all of these things are going to happen to you. God laughs. That means he is in derision to them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and he terrifies them in his wrath. And he says, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Why does the world hate the Bible? Why does the world hate Jesus? Why may, you know, why may he be brought out in their mind? Because he convicts them of sin and they don't want to hear that. They don't want to do it. Correct. He's the truth. He's the way. He's the life. Josiah. Because the heart is evil, do all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Thank you very much. I'm really impressed with how your answers. And so when, when they hear of Christ, understand everybody knows. God. Everybody knows. Romans chapter 1. I wish I had put it on here. But you know, everyone knows God. We know him by his work, by the creation. You've never met a person who, if they told you the truth, doesn't know there's a God. They've got it repressed. They've got it hidden. And so when you and I speak of God, we speak of Christ, that upsets their worldview, and they become angry. They become enraged. Because they, they believe humans have the authority. The humans are enthroned. 
and God says, I am in throne, not you guys. I've installed my, installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. And he says, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, and he says, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. What does verse 8 mean? The Father is speaking to Christ. Ask of me, and I'll make the nations your inheritance. I love your answer, Isabel, and I'm going to enrich it. Christ intercedes for the nation. And his interceding affects you and me directly. It goes back to Genesis 3.15, the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And so he says to Christ, you ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. I think Psalm 2 is very effective in describing the division that's going on in our world today. Now, we have about five minutes, and I, I want to get started on this, and I was hoping to finish this, but I speak too long. You have biblical characteristics of kingdom citizens. And I'm speaking of children, I'm speaking of young people, I'm speaking of adults. What biblical characteristics are there of kingdom citizens? And the first one that I have is that they have been created by God. That's very powerful. Everyone has been created by God. But biblical characteristic of kingdom citizens begins that you and I have been created by God. Why did God create you? Lily, for his pleasure. Who agrees with Lily? Look, Lily, you got 100% in your favor. What's another reason? God created you for his purpose. Who agrees with Isabel? Hey, what's another reason? For his own glory. Who would agree with Kendon for his glory? Another reason, Josiah. To disciple. To disciple. Who would agree with Josiah? Yeah. He chose us in him to be made holy and righteous. That's discipleship. Boy, you kids are not wrong yet, but there's one more reason. Pain. For us to enjoy him? For us to enjoy God. Who would agree with pain? Yeah. And there's still one more reason. John. To rule over the earth. To rule over the earth. Who agrees with John? And there's still one more reason. <laughs> I'll give you a clue. It's the same reason Jeanette made that delicious bacon and cheese. To enjoy his creation. To enjoy his creation. And there's still one more reason. <laughs> to have a relationship with him? Have a relationship with God. Who agrees with her? And there's still one more reason. 
Abby. Because he loves us. Would you say that loud and clear? Because he loves us. Because he loves us. Who agrees with Anna? Yeah. He loved us. He knew us. He wanted to enjoy us. And all of your answers are absolutely excellent. Creation would not be complete if just one of them, kingdom citizens, had not been brought into being. Would you agree with that? Every kingdom citizen, if one of them was missing, would creation be complete? It would not be complete. How did God know his creation was complete? Why? How did he determine that at the end of day six, it is very good, and on day seven, he rested. Not because he was tired, but because he was what? Finished. Finished. Just like you're cleaning your kitchen, and you clean and you clean, but you can't rest until it's finished. And how do you know when it's finished? Joe's on. It'll be good. It'll be good. And if you're cleaning it, your mom would be the one to determine that. Is that right? <laughs> huh? But if you're cleaning your own kitchen, how do you know when it's finished? Spotless. <laughs> Spotless. It depends on your character. If you can live in a mess, it's finished. <laughs> if you need to live in a spotless kitchen it's not finished until then so how does God know that he was finished with all of his work because it was perfect it was perfect it reflected his character it reflected his power reflected his wisdom reflected his now his carrot. All right? Everything. Sometimes I've asked you this before. Why does God need billions, be billions of galaxies? Josiah. For us to explore. We're going to do that, I think, in the new heaven and the new earth. Thank you, Josiah. For his you, glory. For his glory. Did he need a billion of them? Yes. Yes, he did. <laughs> and he needed them because he had all of these ideas, all of these plans. You're the same way. You have a lot of recipes, right? You have a lot of plans for landscape. You have a lot of plans for your life. And so your life is so full. But all of them reflect who you are. And your goal is to Show people, this is, this is who I am. This is my character. God was finished when the creation fully and completely revealed his power and understand each one of us is so important to God that he could have never said it is finished if you had not been in that plane. Each of us is unique. We'll get into that too, but now it's 7 o'clock. And I really enjoy teaching you. I really thank you again, Dan and Ellen, for your soup. Did you leave those plugged in? <laughs> we love the soup. Thank you so much. Let us close in prayer. Our Father, you are our teacher. You lead us and you guide us by putting enmity between us and the serpent and his seed. 
We're not at home with them. We find no pleasure in them. We cannot have deep fellowship with them because your spirit convicts us of sin. Your spirit convicts us of what's righteous. And we praise and glorify you that by your choosing us before the creation of the world, that this enmity has protected us and your church. May we continue to stand firm on the truth. May we always give a reason for the hope that is in us. And we pray that you will bless this land, bless this country. May you live in the hearts of many. May you live in the hearts of our leaders so that you are glorified. Your name is hallowed in this land. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you again, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you.